And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we ask these things. And the church says, amen. Every day we walk within it. Most of us unaware of it, holding fast to it nonetheless, as we breathe its air and take in its beauty, as we work its land and cultivate its commerce. We create in it, laugh in it, dance in it, raise our families in it, kneel and pray for it. But here, here is the day where we stop and look at it. Really look at it. We light up the sky for it. Wave our flags with a special kind of joy. Gather our neighbors and loved ones and let freedom ring. Over the mountains we climb through the neighborhoods where we live our lives and into the night sky that watches it all. We celebrate our freedom and press on to perfect the process of democracy. Our democracy. With every hearty handshake and every bright firework and each prayer of Thanks to God for all of it, we continue to pursue the protection of life. We keep protecting the hard-fought liberty. Out of many, we have become one. This week, we will celebrate the 4th of July, Independence Day, the birth of our country. It's a birthday. And today, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to ask God to bless America. We're going to look at the quid pro quo in Scripture. I will do this if you do that. Now, I want to, I want to just create a theme song for today, if I can do that. Because I want to end this service with this song, but I want to start the message with the song. It's an old song, but it talks about how awesome God is. And what I want to finish today with you looking at God's hand of provision and favor and providence on you, on your family. The song's pretty simple. I've asked Corey, Corey, your team's did a great job today already. But, but I, I want him to lead us. I want Corey to sing this song through one time, then for us to join the song. But I want you to listen to the power of the words. It's very simple. It's very simple. And I don't know about you, but God, to me, is he's deep in some areas, but he's simple. And I want to tell everybody in this house that our God is not playing hide-and-go-seek with us. He's out in the open. He wants to be found. He wants, to, he wants you to find him. But Corey, if you will, sing through this one time, and then we'll join you the second time. Through. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God.
Oh, it sounds good. Some power in love. Stay right here. Israel's going into battle. Sing it again. Walking through the valley towards the enemy. America again. I want to tell you a story. I want you to stand for a minute, then we'll get into the scripture. But I heard a story about this, this woman. She had two small children, and she was a single mom. Her husband had left her. She laid her two kids down at night, and she prayed with them, and she went to her room, and she laid on her bed, and she cried, Lord, I'm a single mom. I'm having trouble making ends meet. The rent's going to be due at this month. Could you please help me by letting me win the lottery? Two weeks pass. She puts her kids down for bed. Same routine. She prays with them. She goes back to her room. She, she puts her head on her pillow and she says, Lord, I lost my job today. The rent's going to be due in, a, in about two weeks. And I got a car payment. I can't do this financially. Could you please help me just win the lottery? Two more weeks pass. She puts her kids down. She goes back to her bedroom. She lays on her bed. She said, Lord, you know I'm a single mom. The rent's due tomorrow, and I don't have it. My car payment's due. They're going to they're gonna come get my car. Lord, could you please just let me win the lottery? And about that time, light shines into her room from heaven. An angel steps out of the light. The angel looks frustrated. He says, woman, for the love of God, he wants to help you, but you have to buy a ticket. <laughs> now listen. There are certain things in Scripture where God says, I will do this if you will do this. We can't expect to win God's favor and protection and provision if we're not willing to walk in how he said to walk. So there's some things I want to talk to you today about getting the first things first. If God's going to bless America again, we've got to get things lined up with God. So I'm going to take my scripture from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It's a famous scripture, but I want to read it to you. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Notice, God said, if my people would be these, if, if they would just do these four things, the most powerful word in this whole passage to me is the next word, then. I won't do it until you do your part. He says, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. We can't ask God to heal America until we're willing to do what he's asked us to do. The Bible says his word will not return void. So today, I'm going to talk to you about the quid pro quo. God said, I will, if you will. I'll do this if you do that. There is a responsibility setting upon us, the church. Not everybody. He says, if my people. My people. When this is written, it's written to the Israelites. 
Today, since we are grafted into the kingdom of God through the bloodshed of Jesus Christ, he's talking to believers, my people. I think it starts at the church. It starts with us. We are the church. Are we ready for this? Lift your hands with me. Father, today, Lord, we declare in this house that you are God, that you are sovereign. And Lord, we also declare that we are your people. We stand humbly before you. And Father, we recognize in your word that you want to speak to us, that you want to forgive our sin, you want to heal the land, but there's something you've required of us. Father, let us line up with your word today. Challenge us, educate us, strengthen us, motivate us. And Lord, we'll never fail to give you the glory, give you the honor, and give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Before you see to tell three people, God bless America. You may be seated. I started doing a little bit of research, this getting ready for this today. By the way, next, next week, we're going to start a sermon series that's going to take us through the end of August. It's, it's simply called, We Believe. That's it. On time. But next week, we're going to start a series on We Believe. It, and we're going to talk about, for the next two months, our declaration of faith. What do we believe, and why do we believe it? It's going to be powerful. On, on August 11th, we're going to have a sermon called The Wedding. I'm going to do my best to decorate this place like a wedding. You're going to be one of the special guests coming to the wedding. And we're going to talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to be good. You do not want to miss this summer. Listen, it's okay to go out of town with your family on vacation. That's good. You need to do that. Spend time with your family. But do not miss the house of God if you're in town. Robin, I'm going to say that again. I want you to punch it hard. We do not miss the house of God when we're in town. Amen. Praise the Lord. There it is. Thank you, Robert. Here's what I want. I want to talk to you about a word that we don't talk about much. Okay? It, it, it's a word that has come from our forefathers. It's the word providence. Providence. The definition of providence is the protective care of God you know, or, or being covered by spiritual power. Our forefathers always said that we walk in providence. We're under providence. And what it means when they say that is we're always under the care and protection of God. I want my family under providence. I want my marriage under providence. My children under providence. I want this church under providence. So I want, I want to read to you some historical things with providence. George uh, Bancroft said this. He said, Providence is the light of history and the soul of the world. God is in history, and all history has unity because God is in it. God is everything. I want to take you back to our forefathers. Contrary to what educators are not teaching, This country was founded on faith in God. If you ever take time to go back and read the documents, don't go what people tell you. Go back and read. They're there to read. Read them. Our forefathers constantly talked of providence, that, that everything that they did back in that day was under the protection of God. They feared God. They walked in favor with God. They prayed to God. Now today... Our history teachers try to not teach that. They'll teach the forefathers, but they don't teach the little things between the lines of how our forefathers walked. Not lying, just not telling everything. So I want to read to you a couple of things. Our forefathers believed in providence. William Bradford, the governor of the pilgrims, he said this, he says, but these things did not dismay them, speaking of the pilgrims, for their desire, for their desires were set on the ways of God. 
and to enjoy his ordinances, but they rested on his providence and knew who they had believed. They, as bad as it got, they rested on the fact that God was their provider and protector. He covered them. Hmm. The Declaration of Independence says this. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives and our fortunes and our sacred honor. We're putting everything that we have on the line because we believe God is over this. It's pretty powerful. George Washington, the first president of the United States. If you watched the presidential debate the other night, I want to take you back to what a president should look like. Okay? It's not political. It's not political. If you want to go back and see how things should be done, go back to the first one. George Washington, in 1789, at his Thanksgiving proclamation, he said this, It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God. Did any one of those candidates recognize the providence of Almighty God? No, they did not. He says, To obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to employ His protection and favor. What would you have done if one of those presidential candidates would have said, can I just pause for a minute and let us thank the Lord for this opportunity and his favor upon us? If anything like that would happen, I believe America would break out in revival. Hmm. Reverend A.W. Folgeby said this. He said, the more thoroughly a nation deals with its history, the more decidedly will be will it recognize and own and overruling providence therein. And the more religious a nation it will become, while the more superficial it deals with its history, which is not believing history, seeing only secondary causes and human agencies, the more irreligious it will be. We cannot forget where we've come from. You cannot be held accountable for what you were taught in school when you're an educated person. Read for yourself. All right. When I put this together, I have two thoughts. I have the quid pro quo. God says, I'll do this if you do that. If you hold up your end of the bargain, God said, I'll hold up my end of the bargain. In Psalms 33, verse 12, it said this, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. I want to make, make it clear, as we read through the Old Testament, he's talking about Israel. When you read through the New Testament, he's talking about us. The promises of God, the Bible says, are yes and amen. The Bible says that we as believers, as Christians that are not Jewish and not Israelites, the Bible says when we came into relationship with Jesus Christ, we were grafted into the family. Just like someone who's been adopted into a family, when you go through the court system, you're part of that family. You are a member at the table, and you have the same rights as a biological son or daughter. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. It's written on our tenure, on our, all of our monies. Or for you guys that are French speaking, all our monies. Thank you, Gigi. The first part of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. God said, if my people will do this. Take it personal. If I'm grafted into the kingdom, if I'm grafted into the family, then he says, if my people, he's talking to me. If you're a believer, he's talking to you. So God is telling me, Jason, if you will do these things, I will do these other things. 
So this, I'm just going to make it very simple. He was speaking to the nation of Israel, but as we read it in the New Testament, he's speaking to the church. If my people, not everybody in America is God's people. Those who don't believe there is a God, they're not his people. Those who curse his name, they're not his people. It's the people who call him Lord he's speaking to. If my people, who are called by my name. So here's, here's, what, here's what 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 says. It says, For the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. Where does judgment begin? Right here. You're the church. It begins in you. For the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? It's going to be bad. So if, if, it, if it begins with us, we will be held accountable. My job today is to educate you on the accountability. All right. The first thing he said, he goes, if my people will humble themselves. There's something about humility. There's something about humbling yourself under a power that's stronger than you. And this, this is what James 4.10 says. He says, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. You don't exalt yourself, he will exalt you. What does that mean, Pastor Jason? That means you walk in the humility under God that he, is, he has all providence over you. He has all power over you. And you know that. I don't take credit for anything. And if any time somebody says something to me, I say, to God be the glory. He is so good. And the Bible says when you humble yourself under the Lord, James says, he will exalt you. You want a, you want a promotion at work? Walk in favor with God at work. If you're single and you want a great spouse and you've been praying for a husband or a wife, walk in humility under God and God will exalt you. If you go fishing in the swamp, you're going to catch something from the swamp. Come on. You get what you're fishing for. Praise God. That'll preach. Humble ourselves. The second thing God said, he said, I want you to pray. You can't pray without being humbled. Prayer is communication. Prayer is speaking and prayer is listening. Prayer is not giving God your Santa Claus list. I want this, 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 and this. And if you can, that. And then walk away. Prayer is talking and prayer is listening. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 7 says, pray without ceasing. Well, how can anybody do that, Pastor? You've got to pray all the time. You live in a constant communication with God. What does that mean? Now, do you understand? I run all this by Susie, so Susie gets all the questions. She goes, is that a trick question? No, it's not a trick question. I want to know what you think. And Susie goes, it's just hard to live a life constantly in prayer. I said, but, but you and I are in a relationship, Susie. Don't we talk to each other all the time? She goes, yeah. I said, it, it's a relationship. If I'm, in, if I'm in constantly in prayer or praying without ceasing, that means when, when Jason is running late and every, every light seems to be green, <laughs> Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. <laughs> I recognize that light is green. The providence over me. And there are times that light is red and I'm running late. Lord, I know there's a reason for me sitting here. I don't know what it is. But I'm constantly talking to God, and then there are times God is speaking to me. You know, God will speak to you through many different avenues. Some of us want God to speak in an audible voice, but I want to see you every Sunday. I think if God spoke to you in an audible voice, we wouldn't see you. You'd be curled up in your fetal position in the shower. But God speaks to me in weird places, weird times. God speaks to me through people. I, I don't, when I go to church services that are not at Valley, I keep my head down. I don't make eye contact because everybody's got a prophetic word for me. 
I mean, I'm telling you, because God's like, I got you around. People that'll listen to me, I got some things for you, Jason. We had camp meeting a couple weeks ago, and then right after camp meeting, the next week was, was senior camp for the, for the high school kids. The week during camp meeting, a man came up to me, and I just met the guy. He's a young pastor, and I was just trying to meet him and pour into him. And He came back to me the next day. He said, he said God, God woke me up last night with a message for you. I'm just like, oh, okay. I, I want to know. Inquiry minds. He said, God told me to tell you to not stop dreaming. And I said, okay. I, I, I received that. Because we just opened this building, and, and God said, Jason, don't stop dreaming. That's not the end of this journey. Amen. So we're, we're at youth camp in one of the services, and one of my former staff members from Hampton, uh, Josue, Josue works in the prophetic. And during the altar service, he came up to me, he said, hey, I, hey, pastor, I need to tell you something. I'm like, Josue, what's up? He goes, I need to tell you something. He goes, when I was praying, God told me to tell you to keep on dreaming. One, the week before, said, don't stop dreaming. And the next week, God said, keep on dreaming. And he said it to me. I said, stop. He, he said, well, I, I said, are you messing with me? He said, no, that's what God told me. He, God told me to tell you three things. But the first one was, keep on dreaming. Don't stop dreaming. Keep on dreaming. Don't stop dreaming. And so I just said, I, I said, oh, I swear, I, I received that word, man. And I, I find myself in a quiet place of saying, God, I hear you. I don't know what it means, but I hear you. Pay for this building. <laughs> so we'll keep dreaming. Listen, God is always wanting to hear from you. Somebody asked me the other day, we were talking about relationships, and I said, the only reason Susie and I got married is because she pursued me. That, listen, that comes across very arrogant to say, but I don't mean it that way. Susie was out of my league. I didn't think there was a chance, but she kept calling me on Wednesday nights when she was at school. And every time she called me, my heart got full. Susie's on the phone, everybody get out, get out, get off the phone. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> but she, she pursued me with interest that showed me that she was interested because I was interested. But I didn't know she was. But when she pursued me, it gave me confidence to pursue her again. When we speak to God in prayer, we are pursuing him. He wants us to pursue him. And prayer is simply communication. God, what are, you, what are you doing today? Well, I'm blessing you, Jason, with providence. Lord, I receive that. Something happens at work. I don't know why it happened at work. It was, it, it, somebody's having a bad day, but Lord, I just want to give you glory through this situation. I don't know where this is going, but Lord, help me honor you through it. You know, that prayer without ce praying without ceasing is talking to God all the time. Keeping him on your mind. He calls you, you call him. If you keep your eyes open, you'll see God speaking to you all the time. All the time. I believe he still opens deaf ears. Huh? He said, humble yourselves, pray. Then he said, seek my face. Seek God. Come after me. Search for me. What's amazing, I said it earlier, God is not playing hide and go seek. Ready or not, here I come, God. Oh, there you are. You're standing right out in the middle of the road. God said, you found me. Seek me. In the Old Testament, it talks about how men were seeking God's face. When you're in a relationship with somebody, the most intimate moment you can have is when, not when you go hand to hand or hand to body. It's face to face. Cheek to cheek. That's a moment. And God says, I want to have a moment with you. I want to be intimate with you. Come into the secret place with me. Seek my face. The Bible says that Moses spoke to God face to face. Like a friend would speak to a friend. 
We didn't ask that. God asked that. God said, seek me, and you'll find me. Get into the, in, I'm, God said, I've opened the doors to my inner chamber. I'm inviting you in to the secret place. Most of us are afraid to go into that place, but he's inviting us into the place. You don't have to have a key. You don't have to have a secret knock. He said, come. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And once again, I, I was sitting with Susie the other day and I said, hey, what, what do you think that means? She goes, I don't know what uh, all these things are. <laughs> and I said, well, the, well, to get context, you read the, the verse before it. You read the verse after it. So I, just, I backed it up about three or four verses. And this is what God said. God said, you, you, you're, you're looking for clothing, for shelter, for food. He said, you're seeking after all these things. But then he said, but seek me first. Come after me. Before you chase all the other stuff, come after me. And I'll give you all that stuff. So think about this. No, let me read it one more time. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Notice the provision comes once we go after him. Daddy's got it. I don't want to be disrespectful and call him a sugar daddy, but he's got it. He's got everything you want, everything you desire. You want your marriage blessed? Seek after him. You want your kids coming out of some crazy, weird place? Seek after him. And he'll add all these things to it. I don't know if you see the formula. He said, humble yourself, pray, come after me. Come get me. Then he says this. He says, and repent. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, it says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's here. His kingdom is here. He's ready. The definition of repent, in case anybody doesn't know the definition of repent, it says, to feel or to express sincere regret or remorse about one's wrongdoing or sin. That means, Lord, I am sorry for the mess I've made this. I didn't know it was going to be this bad when I got in it, but Lord, I have messed this up tremendously. Lord, forgive me for what I have done with my life. Forgive me for what I've done with my marriage, what I've done with my kids. Lord, forgive me how I've jacked up this job. Repentance. He says, repent. Lord, I'm sorry. Now notice. God said, if you do these four things, if you humble yourself, if you pray, if you seek after me and you repent, he said, that's where I want you. And if you can get to that place, I'm going to show you great and mighty things. We pray for God to do great things, but we don't do any of those things. Notice he didn't say, if you do two out of the four, I'll hook you up with 50%. He didn't say that. He said, do these things. Now, let me, let me share something with you here. There is a direct correspondence between obedience and prosperity and disobedience and hardship. There is a correlation between the two in Scripture. Obedience leads to prosperity. Now, when I say prosperity, I'm not, I'm not talking about riches and money, which could be. But sometimes you can be rich in a relationship. Sometimes you can be rich with great health, great favor. Some of my best friends don't have a lot of money, but when they can make a phone call, things happen. That's favor. That's, that's prosperity. So notice obedience and prosperity. When Abraham was asked to sacrifice Isaac, his prosperity came from his obedience. What would have happened if Abraham said, Lord, I can't do that? What if Mary, when the angel showed up to Mary and said, Mary, you are highly favored among women. God is going to bless you. He's going to come into your womb. You're going to carry God for nine months, and you're going to birth God. What if Mary would have said no? But she didn't. 
She said, let it be unto me as you have spoken. I will be obedient. I'm scared of this. I've never been with a man. I don't know what's going on here. But Lord, since you have asked, I will be obedient. Hmm. Well, if that's true, then disobedience brings hardship. I looked up in the Bible. You'd be surprised I had to look this up, but who was the first person that was disobedient? <laughs> the first person. <laughs> Adam and Eve. God said, don't. They did. Hardship followed. We are still dealing with the hardship of that disobedience. Jonah. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh. He disobeyed. He went the other way. Hardship came. Notice the formula. We were floating down the river yeah, the other day, and then this is the conversation that came up with me and some teenage boys. We were talking about biblical questions and stuff, and I said, think about this. The Bible doesn't say what kind of fish it was that swallowed Jonah. I believe God made that fish up on the moment. I don't think there's ever been a fish like this in the whole world. A fish could swallow a man whole, and the man survive in its belly with all the acid and stuff. But, but the Bible says Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, for three days, and had a conversation with God. And I've told you before, I think the conversation went like this. This is my translation, so don't email me or anything like that. I believe God asked Jonah, he said, Jonah, you've upset me, son. You've been disobedient to me, but I love you. So the next question you have to answer is, what, what end of this fish do you want to come out of? Because your answer to this next question is going to determine you're coming out the mouth or you're going to be on the bottom. The Bible says Jonah repented. The Bible says that fish, I think that was, that was just made perfect for this moment, swam right to the shore and let Jonah walk out onto the shore. Disobedience brings hardship. I, I just feel I need to say this to somebody. I don't know how you were raised. I don't know what you were taught when you were a child. I don't know what you know about God. But somebody in this house is afraid to walk with God because you're afraid of what he may ask of you. And I want to tell you, do not be afraid of God. He loves you. The moment I gave my life to Jesus Christ and I said, Lord, if you open the door, I'll walk through it. He began to open doors that I could not open. I was unqualified to walk through those doors. And I told you, every time I go to church, someone prophesies over me. I was at church years ago, and somebody looked at me and said, God's going to promote you, but it's not going to be the way everybody else is promoted. People are not going to like you because of how you're getting promoted, but God's going to do it through you, and you just walk where he tells you to walk. I said, I don't know what that means. But Lord, if you open the door, I'll walk through it. So I want to tell somebody in this house, quit being afraid of what you don't know or understand. And just pray that the providence of God is over you. His protection is over you. Should a, should a believer say something that they feel God is telling them in the moment? And if they do, should he keep it PG? Somebody in this house is dealing with an issue in your marriage and it's physical. It's sexual. Do you not think God wants to fix that? You don't think God wants to restore the passion in your home? I'm telling you, He does. The Bible says... This is not part of my message, but the Bible says the marriage bed is undefiled. What goes on in your bedroom is your business, if you're married. God has given that woman to that man and given that man to that woman. God has anointed that time together. And the enemy has come in to pervert it, to destroy it. I bind pornography and the spirit of pornography in this house right now in Jesus' name. I bind every stronghold in everybody's marriage right now in Jesus' name. I want to tell somebody in this house, if we're talking like big boys and big girls, there is life after pornography. But you've got to get a hold of it. So, 
God said, if you do this, I will do this. Let's look at what he said. He, he said, if, if you will humble yourself, pray, seek my face, and repent, he said, then, then, then is a transition word that means something comes first, then something next, second. So what comes first is the humbling, the prayer, the seeking, the repentance. He said, then I will do this. He said, he said I will hear from heaven. He says, I will speak to you. I will communicate with you. I will lead you. I will guide you. I will be providence for you. He said, then I'm going to forgive your sin. I will forgive everything that is between you and me. I'll put it under the blood. He said, I will show you mercy. You don't deserve it. He said, but I love you, and I'll give it to you. Then he said this. He said, when you hear from me, and I forgive your sin, he said, I will heal your land. That land here can be many different things. You know, here today we're talking about America. God healed this country. Let us get back to our roots and what we were founded on. But I also believe that land could be your home, could be your marriage, could be your family, could be your job, could, could be your siblings. God, I need you to heal these things. I need you to set these things in order. We serve a God of a turnaround, that he can turn it around. I believe that. But Pastor, why do you believe it? Because he's done it in my life multiple times. He's done it in my family multiple times. We thought it was going one way. We, we prayed, we fasted, we humbled ourselves, we repented, we were seeking his face. And I watched that thing just come back around. Like my golf swing, it starts here, it comes right back around. But he brought it back around. We're like, Lord, we see you. Thank you for your providence over us. Something else would happen. Lord, we need you to turn it around. The application is this. The church must be the church. We cannot back down, we cannot recant, and we cannot surrender the word of God. He said, if you're ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before the Father. I want him standing boldly before the Father on my behalf and on your behalf and on behalf of this church. Therefore, we do not recant, surrender, or retreat. We must stand up against evil. Evil. If you ignore evil, it will end up on your front porch. I would much rather fight it when it's down the street than fight it in my front yard. We must seek or we must speak out against the things that offend God. If they offend God, they should offend us. The problem is, most of us are living a lifestyle that is, offen that is offensive to God. We, we speak boldly in the church, but we go out and we do whatever we want to do. How can God honor that? He, he, he's not going to honor that. Listen, you can fool man. You can fool me. You can fool Corey. You, you might be able to fool your mama, but you cannot and you will not ever fool God. When I was a, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, they told us God can see in the dark. So what's that mean? And then they would say, what's done in the dark, he's going to bring it to the light. He knows what you did. So why don't you just repent? Pastor Jason wants the best for everybody in this house. But to have the favor of God, the provision of God, and the providence of God, you've got to walk with God. If you do these things, God said, I'll do this. But most of us don't know Scripture. We're asking for these things, and we're not doing our part. We must share the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. We must not sit idly by 
while unbelievers drive this great country to hell. And that's what's going on. I told you from the beginning, I don't care how you vote. You vote, you vote your conscience. Just know the values that you're voting for. So this will never get political from this platform. Because I think, I think our spiritual walk goes far beyond pol politics. What you lay your head on your pellet at night with is right or wrong. That's what you live by, by the word of God, if you're a Christian. Our country is pulling away from the things of God. From the providence of God. Our forefathers laid it down that it's by the providence of God, it's by the protection of God, it's by the hand of God, it's by the outstretched arm of God that we are here today, and we have somehow got away from that, but it is the church that's got to pull it back together. It begins in the house of God. Stand with me. I don't know where you are today. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to pray with you. I want you to come up front as we start singing today. But here's what I want everyone else to do. I want to finish with the song we started with for this message. I want you to think about that word providence over you as a person. The protection of God over you as a person, over your marriage, over your family, your home, your neighborhood, your schools, your job. And as we sing the song, if you think about it, and he's been protecting you, guiding you, you need to tell him thank you. You need to worship him. If you, if you need to meet the Lord today as your Lord and Savior and give your heart to Jesus Christ, I'm going to meet you up front here today. Core of you, if you will. He's an awesome God, he reigns from heaven above with wind. Some power and love, our God is an awesome God, our God, he's an awesome God, he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power and love, our God is an awesome, sing it out, say our God, he's an awesome God, he reigns.
Just the voices, our God. Just the congregation. Every voice. Sing it, sing it. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise today. Hallelujah. As we walk out of this house today, I want you to set in memory the word providence. When you pray for your home, Lord, we want your providence over this home. We pray for our marriage, Father, we want your providence over our marriage. Speak it to your spouse. Speak it. There's, there's life and death in the tongue, the words we use. Speak life over your marriage. Speak life over your home. Speak life over your children. We want the providence of God. Lift your hands with me. Father, today, Lord, we thank you for this time to be, just to be in your house, to worship together, to hear your word, and to fellowship with other believers. Father, I thank you for salvation. I thank you, Lord, that, that, that a child has come home today. The prodigals are returning. And Father, we want to thank you for your hand of protection over us. May we never take it for granted. May we never ignore it. And Father, we recognize today the quid pro quo of this relationship. There is something you expect from us before you move. And Father, let us be faithful in giving to you. Father, we give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Evan, go ahead and lift up one more hand clap of praise. Hey, what a great day it has been. Thank you for worshiping with us. We want to invite you guys this coming Wednesday to come back out. It will be the first Wednesday of July, and that means we have our super service. It starts at 6.30. So if you've never been a part of a super service, hey, it's just a great night. We have some old school preaching, have some great worship. We want to invite you out. Uh, Pastor Mark Hambrick is going to be bringing the word. So you want to be here this Wednesday for that. But thank you for worshiping with us today. If you will, please share with me in our benediction, Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you guys. Have a great day.